<laughs> yeah. Wow. So to have them keep going and I'm going to sit down. Uh, uh, that's awesome, wasn't it? Thank you guys. Thank you so much. It is so good to, to uh, have uh, these guys with us this morning. Didn't they do an awesome job? Just amazing. Just <laughs> leading us to worship. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty amazing. I'm always amazed at the talent that, that uh, God has in, our, in, our, in this body of believers and, and at Olivet. It's such a great place and such a, you know, uh, Cheryl and I sent our girls up there uh, this year for the first time. And, uh, man, I, they are just, I, I couldn't be happier with the experience that they're having. Um, it's pretty cool to get a message from your daughter that says, hey, chapel was awesome today. So, uh, what they do and what you guys do up there, Carlos, is uh, it's more than just an education. It's more than just, uh, uh, you know, a college experience. But uh, uh, these men and women are, are becoming uh, followers of Jesus Christ and they're being poured into by people that love them and care for them and are followers of Christ. And that is priceless from an education standpoint. So uh, just a little, you, you can pay me later for that, Carlos. <coughs> I'll send you a bill. Um, um, you know, I, uh, I shouldn't have smoked that one pack this morning. Uh, I'm uh, struggling with that a little, um, but uh, pray for me this morning as I try to get through this. I uh, came back, and it's, you know, it's harvest season, so that does wonders for my voice. <clears throat> but we have been in a, a four-week series called uh, Ticked. Uh, where we've just been talking about anger and, and how we deal with that in our lives. And uh, I don't know, anybody ticked this morning? Anybody? Uh, okay, nobody that would admit. Oh, yes, I see that hand. You don't have to. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny. We, we've talked about a lot of different things. Anybody yell at your kids on the way to church this morning? Yes, all right. Thank you for that. It's an honest crowd this morning. So uh, shut up. We're going to see Jesus. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been talking about this subject, and we have all sort. we have, you know, we have those moments of being angry, and it's okay to be angry, it's okay to be offended, it's okay to be ticked off, and the challenge for us uh, who are following, are trying to follow Jesus Christ is how we react to that, and how we respond to that anger uh, in our life, and we're reminded in Ephesians uh, to never let our, to never sin in our anger. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27 says, and don't sin by letting your anger control you. I underline that. <clears throat> don't sin by letting your anger control you. Don't let it grab, grab that foothold. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. And we talked about that. That word uh, foothold is actually a trap. It's, it's that uh, when, when it gets a hold of us. And we've talked about a lot of different things. We've talked about uh, how, how uh, anger um, can cause us to be vengeful and unforgiving. It can cause us to react harshly or stew or situations until they erupt violently. It can cause us to step into a trap of being offended and feel like we have the right to be angry. Um, but however... Once in a while, and most of the time, I think most of the time, <clears throat> we try to control our anger. We, we want to tr we try to control that. It's an emotion. It's part of uh, how God made us. It's okay to be angry, uh, but every once in a while, it gets the best of us, uh, but we, we try to control that. However, once in a while, anger uh, lights a fire, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but anger can light a fire in us that pushes us into action. Have you ever noticed that? Anybody ever experienced that in your life where you've just been so angry and you're like, oh, well, I'm going to show you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you, and, and, it, and it lights this fire, uh, and, it's, and, and, and there's a term that, that if you've been around the church at all for uh, a little bit, maybe you've heard this term, and maybe you haven't, and maybe it's a, just a, a church term that you haven't heard, but there's this term uh, called righteous indignation, right? And it's this, this, this idea, and I, I actually defined it, I looked it up, and it's, and it's defined as this. A righteous indignation is typically a reactive emotion of anger over mistreatment, insult or malice. It's akin to what is called a sense of justice, in some Christian doctrines, righteous anger is considered the only form of anger which is not sinful, which is interesting. In order to under, but, but I think sometimes we can be, uh, we can think, you know, uh, my dad used to say, well, I'll hit him with the, the strong arm of righteous indignation. I was like, okay, maybe not, dad. <clears throat> 
But uh, I think in order for us to understand this anger hall pass, if you will, because I think sometimes we want to try to say, well, it was righteous indignation. I was just angry that, that uh, something bad had happened and it was, it was, uh, I was mistreated or, or there's some kind of weird injustice that, uh, uh, that's happened that, that gives us permission to be angry. And so in order to, to kind of figure that out, I think we have to look at a couple things. We have to look at uh, God's anger versus our anger because it's not the same. It's different. Uh, and and uh, we we looked at it. so. Let me ask you this: Have you ever um, have you ever had someone angry with you, and you had no idea why? Like you you didn't know what you did, but somebody was like somebody was ticked off. Yes, not don't say yesterday. We'll, we'll get to that. <clears throat> Just share online. I had one. Just FYI, ushers, could we get um, some help down front? <clears throat> um, uh, we had moments of anger where you're angry with somebody. I, I, just, I had a snot thing happen there. Um, uh, but I, I remember when I was working at the bank, I uh, had these customers, and I don't remember, I don't know who they were. Um, I can you remember? I can't, I knew, and for the life of me, uh, I knew them. I, I had seen them at the bank, and uh, uh, they'd been in, and I'd, I'd helped them. I remember actually helping them. And uh, <clears throat> so when I was out, I was out one day for lunch, and I went into Subway, and I saw him, and I pulled up. It was at the old Subway before the new one was built. And I pulled up, and I could see him sitting right there at the window, and I think I may have shared this story before. But I just kind of waved at him, and they just kind of gave me a glare, and I was like, well, that's weird. And so I went in, and I was like, hey, how are you? And didn't say a word, didn't say a word. And so I thought, man, I don't know what's up there. So I went and got my sandwich and left, and then when I was leaving, I was like, they were look, staring me out through the window, and I just waved, <clears throat> and they proceeded to tell me that I was number one. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Um, like an older lady, it was kind of funny. She was like, mm. I was like, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> And every time I would see them, they would tell me I was number one. Um, but it was, it was just one of those things, but I, and, I, and I think those things happen, but occasionally, sometimes things happen, and, uh, and we know exactly uh, why we're in trouble, uh, like yesterday um, <clears throat> at my house. Um, you know, we, we do something and we know for sure, like, we're going to be in trouble. Like, they're, they're going to be, like, uh, Cheryl and I, we had a, we had a rough day yesterday. Um, and we were angry at each other or frustrated. And so, but here's the thing, and, and when I talk about God's anger and versus human anger, I think sometimes, uh, you know, we live in a culture. Because we live in a time where people are so easily offended, the idea that God gets angry does not set well with our culture. You understand that? Like the, this image of God as, a, man, he gets angry, he gets the, the wrath of God does not sit well with our culture because our culture is so easily offended that they can't imagine. Uh, we you know we love to hear about, uh, we love to hear about the God who loves us, right? And this God that is long suffering and he's patient and he's eager to forgive, and, which, is, which indeed he is. He is, he's this amazing God that, that, is, that is really caring and loving and long-suffering and gave his only son, but there's another side of God that, is, that he is a just God. And he has to be a just God. And so I think we live in a day when we have set ourselves as the judge and God's character is on trial. Why, you know, how can he be that kind of God? How could he actually send someone to hell? How could it be, if, he is, if he's a God of love, why did he allow this to happen? We don't like to be held accountable for our actions. And the God's anger versus our anger is not the same. We must not equate God's anger with our own human experience of that emotion because as God cannot sin, we know that his anger is righteous and unlike the common experience of anger that we have. God's anger is always righteous, it's always justified, and it's always perfect. Ours isn't. And most of the time, our anger is out of selfish, something that happened to me. It's, it's selfish. Vengeance, is, it's misdirected vengeance on our part. And human anger, James 1.20 says this, human anger does not produce the righteousness 
that God desires. In other words, FYI, newsflash, this is the, the Trent Ice version of that passage. You are not the righteous God of the universe. <laughs> Might need to tell somebody that next to you. May come as a surprise to some of you. So what is it? You know, if we, if we understand that, if we are not God. We are, obviously, we know that, right? But God's, God is just and fair God. And in other words, he has, he cannot tolerate sin. And, and, and so when you think about what is it, what is it that God makes, what is it that makes God angry? I think sometimes people are going, well, there's just this, this random God that's just waiting for me to mess up and it's this, this wrath of God that he, that he divvies out at will and whenever he wants to and, uh, you know, and he causes my loved ones to die and he calls, he's just this big mean God. So what is it? And I'm gonna share with you this morning. Um, Anybody have that one thing that just like sends you over the edge? <laughs> when it gets you ticked? It's like it happens every time, you know? Like it doesn't matter what it is or, or who it is, but if that one thing that happens in your life, it just sends you over the edge, God has that one thing. And that one thing that sends him over the edge is sin. He can't tolerate it. He won't tolerate it. We read you Romans chapter two, verse five. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up <laughs> terrible punishment for yourself. I underline this next part for you. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And I think, you know, when I was a kid growing up in church, we, we used to hear a lot of hellfire and brimstone messages, and I lived in fear that, uh, that God would, you know, was gonna come back. And I, I've told you the story about how I came home, the TV was on, and I was pretty sure I was left behind. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, that's it, happened. There you go. I've been left behind. Thanks a lot. Uh, but I lived in that fear. And I think a healthy fear of God is good. And the scripture teaches that. There's another scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, and it says this. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And I think some of you, some of us, some of us church people may be storing up terrible punishment because we've hardened our hearts We've become stubborn and we refuse to let go of the sin that's in our life. And God's scripture is very, very clear about what some of that is. I think some of us are still wrestling with some of you guys and maybe wrestling with pornography and you're refusing to let go of that. It's your hidden little secret. You think nobody knows. I think some of you are in relationships that you know are outside of God's will in your life. And then until, we, until we address some of that sin in our life, those willful transgressions, where you look God in the face and say, you know what, I know you pointed this out in my heart, I know you said that that's really probably not something I should be doing, you know, I really shouldn't be watching those kind of movies, I really shouldn't be going to those places, we shouldn't be talking. You've pointed that out in my life, but I've made a conscious decision to say, you know what, I'm gonna do it anyway. You're storing up terrible punishment. Now, that's kind of a depressing message, right? <clears throat> and I don't know, when I, read that, when I read that scripture, and I read Hebrews chapter 10 that says, it is a terrible thing to fall on the hands of a living God. I don't know about you, but that scares me a little. Like I may have wet just a little when I read that, tinkled. Scares me, makes me fearful. It makes me wanna do a self check and say, well, you know what, I don't, I don't wanna be the source of anger, the source of God's wrath. And let me tell you that if you don't have a healthy fear of God, you better, <clears throat> because he will hold you accountable. And here's the thing though, 
And I know I say all that and you're like, man, that's kind of a, a bad image of God. It's just a big, ugly God. And we don't hear about that sometimes. And we want to we wanna deliver a message that's, that's palatable to people that says, hey, come in here and, and you know, bring all of your, uh, your, your dirty baggage with you and all of the sin that you carry and the things that you did on the weekend and set it down. And we're all, you know, we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. And, and everybody's just saying, yeah, and all that is true. But at some point in time, we have to start living a life that is righteous. At some point in time, we can't just say, hey, you know what? Oh, God, man, I love this part about you, but this part of my life I'm going to hold on to. I'm going to, this part of my life, I don't think you're really going to hold me accountable for that little piece right here. Really, God, are you going to hold me accountable? Yes. If it's outside of what his will is for your life and it's sin that he clearly has pointed out in your life, he will hold you accountable. And here's why. God's wrath is said to be in perfect accordance with God's love. Isn't that awesome? But anyone, and, and John, 1 John 4, 8 actually says, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is what? He's love. He's not this big guy sitting on a throne that's just ticked off and angry and mad at our sin. He, he can't tolerate it, but he loves us. And he wants to have this relationship and he's willing to go to the very ends of the earth. He's willing to give his only son to make a way of escape for us. And God, I read this quote this week, I thought it was good. God must act justly and judge sin. Otherwise, God would not be God. In saving us from his own wrath, you understand that? He saved us from our, his own wrath. God has done what we could not do and he has done what we didn't deserve. He has given us this way of escape. So God must bring justice and retribution for sin for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and no longer under God's wrath. Isn't that awesome? That we can say, you know what? Yeah, I've got sin in my life, God, but you've made a way for me to ask for forgiveness and to, to repent which is a military term that means turn and walk the other direction. You've made this way that you have saved me from your own wrath. He's given us that out because he loves us and he's willing to wait. And I think God is being patient in our society today. He's waiting for you. He's tarrying. He will not tarry forever. He will not wait forever. But he wants to give us till the very last second to make our decision to follow him. Many times we think of anger as a selfish, destructive emotion that we should eradicate. And so, but so, so that's God's piece of it. Let's talk about Jesus. Because when Jesus, when God sent his son Jesus, that was his way of escape for his wrath. He made that way possible. So many times we think of anger as a selfish, destructive emotion that we should eradicate from our lives. But I want to tell you a story. It happened in Mark chapter three. And it's a story about Jesus. He went into the synagogue and he was talking with teachers and they were basically gonna to try to trap him. They wanted, to, they wanted to see if he would actually heal somebody on Sunday, which was against the rules. It was against the law to, to heal or to work on the Sabbath. And so they had this guy that came up. He had this little shriveled hand and they wanted to see if he would heal him. And so we pick up this story in Mark it says, Jesus went into the synagogue and noticed a man. And I want to I pause right there. He noticed a man. <laughs> I think that just, just that, noticed a man. Somebody didn't bring him to him and say, hey, Jesus, you see this guy? He just noticed him. And I wonder how many times we walk in this place and notice anybody that's hurting do we ever walk in and just notice somebody and say, man, they look like they've had a rough week? Are we so in tune with God's spirit that he, that he points those people out to us in our daily lives that we walk in and we sense that somebody's hurting? He noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he, headed, <clears throat> if he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. So he was kind of in this situation. Here's Jesus in this situation. He noticed this man. He's got this deformed hand. And Jesus says, you know what? I, I really want to heal that guy. But I know they're setting this trap for me. 
They want to see if I'll do this. And, and, and that dialogue is back, and they kind of, they know the, these, these, these religious leaders at the time, they know they've got him in this kind of catch-22 situation. And Jesus fires back and says, hey, is it better basically for me to heal this guy? Is it better to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? And so then he looked at them angrily. Verse five, he looked at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and they met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. You see, Jesus was so angry at their hard hearts and these people that couldn't see the need and he was so frustrated and so angry with them. He was angry with the people. He was just, he was saddened and angry at their heart and it spurred him to do something. It created an avenue. Anger propelled him to do something that, that was probably against the law. No, it was against the law. That he knew that would result in his death. It propelled him forward. Ever have a moment like that? Have you ever noticed some kind of injustice or you've noticed something in the world that just isn't right and you're so angry about it? Typically, you know, what we see in our culture today is people will riot or they'll stage some kind of protest but when is that that it sparks us to do something good? And I've talked about this before, but anybody ever watched Popeye growing up? I watched Popeye, loved Popeye. He did that cool thing. Well, he'd get angry, right? He would get so frustrated with Brutus, or, and, he, and, he, he'd get, and, and olive oil was there, and, and he would get angry, and he had that Popeye moment, right? He had that little moment when he's like, okay, I can't stand it, and I can't stand it no more. And he would get that can of spinach. Did anybody, do you guys even know what Popeye is? Okay. Just that was a low blow, I'm sorry. But he'd get that, wait, he'd squeeze that can and it, it I, I would, I've like tried to practice that. Like he'd squeeze it, it would shoot up in the air and then he would catch it in his mouth. I don't know how he did that. <laughs> it's a cool trick. It'd be fun at parties. Hey, watch this. He'd squeeze that can and he'd pop the spinach and then his forearms would just explode and then he would just, that anger just propelled him to do something. And I can't help but think about our church. Are we really truly angry that people are lost and dying? Does it anger us? Does it anger us when we see thousands of foster kids that don't have a home. And nobody, they don't have parents to cuss them. No good night stories, no kiss on the damn forehead. I have people that are hurting all around us. Do we even notice them? I'll tell you what, are we ever get to that moment, you know, I remember several years ago, I was kind of heavy, I've talked about this a lot, but the best illustration I had, you know, it was kind of heavy. I'd been porking out a little. And uh, I made a comment to Cheryl once, and I was like, ah, it's like, I'm gonna get ripped. I was looking in the mirror. I was like, you're not even gonna know to me. And she made a comment back to me. I was like, you're not gonna know me by summer. I think it was like January or something. I was like, I'm just gonna get shredded. <clears throat> and she looked at me and said, I've been hearing that for 25 years. <laughs> and I had a Popeye moment. <laughs> is that fuel? What is it? What is it in our culture that fuels your fire? That spurs you into action? So much so that you're just like, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit in this blue puffy chair any longer. I'm gonna do something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna volunteer. I'm gonna have that awkward moment when I actually say, hi, my name is Trent. I'm gonna introduce myself to somebody that's new. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe you've been living above your means for so long and you're swimming in, in debt up to, your ear, up to your ears and your eyeballs. 
You need to have a Popeye moment. You need to say, you know what? I'm angry. God, I need your help to help me in this position. Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's a situation where you and your wife have had a situation. You know what? The scripture reminds us not to let the sun go down on your anger. And Cheryl and I, we did good. No toe for me, but we did good. So, so you had to be here. <clears throat> but there's things in our life that should anger us, that should spark, should light a fire of righteous indignation in us where we say, you know what? I'm tired of Satan winning in our marriages. I'm tired of Satan pulling people down through pornography. I'm tired of Satan destroying families. I'm tired of Satan tempting us and we get angry and we do something. It's sanctified anger. And I tell you, I need you to fan that flame. (laughs) If there's a fire there, I need you to fan it. But only under these circumstances, that you are reacting against actual sin, that you are more concerned with the offense against God than the offense against yourself, that you are expressing anger in ways consistent with Christian character, and as we all can testify, that kind of righteous anger is difficult and rare but it can happen. I'm gonna ask our uh, Olivet band to come back up. See, in Jesus, in that moment, he looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. His anger was righteous anger because it was motivated by godly concerns and it expressed itself in godly ways. So I think sometimes we can hang our hat on righteous indignation and say, well, they were, you know, that's just evil and that's sin and I'm gonna react this way. But Jesus' anger was always perfect. Jesus' anger had the proper motivation. In other words, he was angry for the right reasons had the proper focus. He was not angry at God or at the weakness of others. His anger targeted sinful behavior and injustice. Jesus' anger had the proper supplement. Jesus' anger stemmed for love for the Pharisees and concern over their spiritual condition. It had the proper control was never out of control. Even in his wrath, was never out of control. It had the proper duration. He never allowed his anger to turn into bitterness. He didn't hold grudges. He dealt with each situation properly and he handled his anger in good time. It had the proper result. Jesus' anger was an the inevitable consequence of godly action. Jesus' anger and all of his emotions was held in check by the word of God and Jesus' response was always, always to accomplish God's will. And I think when we get angry too often, we have improper control or focus or it lasts too long or we hold a grudge and we hold on to it. But I just want you to think about it. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. Now, anger is a funny thing. It can spur us into into motion. And we can take that anger that we feel. And we look around. And if we really, I, I would just ask each of you to search your hearts this morning. Do we really even care enough to get angry? To get angry enough to do something about our marriages? about how we treat one another, about our mission at this church to our community, to Salem Grace, to Salem, Illinois. Does it anger you that people are not here? Do you even care that people are going to die and that are storing up God's wrath for them? It should anger us. It should light a fire in us. As as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should have this burning passion to reach others. Let me pray for you this morning.
Father, thank you so much for your love for us. God, that we know that you love us. We know that there are times that we do things in our sin when we store up your wrath. But Lord, you've made a way escape for us for that through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for, for his sacrifice for our sins. We thank you so much for his example and how we should appropriately deal with our anger. Lord, help us to be angry enough at sin and the things that, that anger you, Lord. Help that to be, help us to be the same level on that. Father, help us to, to use that anger wisely and not to respond in ways that are unchristian or unholy or unlike you or not righteous, but Lord, help us always to respond in our anger appropriately that it can spur us on to good that, Lord, that we might be a powerful force in our community, in the surrounding area. Lord, help us to fight that battle. Go with us, I pray, Lord. Thank you so much for this church. Thank you for your spirit that we felt here this morning. Thank you for this, these, these Olivet students. Carlos, Lord, for their, for their willingness to give of a weekend and to come down here and to, to use their talents. Thank you so much for loving us, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would just help us to be the kind of church that is actionable, that does things, Lord, because we see what's happening in our community around us. Thank you so much for your love and your grace and your forgiveness and your patience for us. Lead us from this place back into our homes, into our workplaces this week and into school. And Father, help us to take you with us and help us to connect and be the light of the world to you this week. Bring us back safe next week in your precious holy name I pray.